thank you so much, St. Paul's University, for doing this. Thank you for inviting me here. It's the first time I'm visiting your campus, so thank you. Um, um, so what we, what we have here, I'll just say for the benefit of the two professors, we have students of language and literature. We have students of life. We have very accomplished literary critics. But what tickles me more is to know that we have a few writers who published one or two things, but we also have a few people who would like to write, but they are afraid. So this is your moment to catch some wisdom from two very accomplished um, creative writers. But I also need to say that the conversation we're going to have here today is not just from creative writers, which the two professors are, they are also very accomplished literary critics. As people who talk about the meaning of creative expression, the merits of the text, and so on. So we will draw from all of those resources uh, in the course of this conversation. I don't want to believe that there is anybody in this audience who hasn't read a single Goye sentence. Is there? Just in case, and you're shy to admit it, let's set the mood by asking the two professors to do some reading for us, so that we familiarize ourselves with what they write, how they write, just the sound of it, yeah? The play of words and so on. Is that okay? We can start with some reading. What I also would like to ask, just say a few words, and then read, yeah? Okay, we'll do that. Um, let me do this, because I'm between father and son. And I actually happen to fall bang in the middle there because Professor Gobe is my mother's age mate. No, 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 sit where you are. I'm happy with you where you are, you won't fight. <laughs> but more seriously, uh, Professor Gobe actually was born in the same year as my mother, so I really feel he is my father. And Mukamba here is my little brother. Now don't worry, I don't actually have any little brothers, so I won't bully you. <laughs> but I will ask that since you're my younger brother, can I for today, to avoid confusion, call you Mukoma when I ask the question and refer to that here as Prof. Is that okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> professor and Professor. <laughs> no, I would not be comfortable with my mother's yeah, okay. age. Professor, to move to the podium there and say a few words and probably give us a reading, please. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll read from this, but I'll need a little bit of help. Can I read from there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we are to connect. Describe my latest book. It's an epic. The first epic, I believe, in its core language. An epic is a long sort of narrative in a uh, vast form. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it's also my first attempt at an epic. And I call it Kedamo Yeru or in English, I shall be calling it the perfect nine, right? The Kikyo people say that their founder was the Koyo and Momi. They had nine daughters. Uh, and the nine daughters, oh, sorry, they were ten, but they say nine. Uh, but they are ten, so when they say they are ten, they say Kedamuyu. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, they say, Keda, nine, Keda, for you, ten. Okay? Um, and they, they make the nine, ten clans of the Koyo people. Every Koyo person belongs to one of the ten clans. Okay? Right. But I was always bothered. I'm sorry, I don't offend anybody, but I was always very bothered by description of our clans. There was a never negativity all the time, even when people were very proud of their clans, you know. Uh, they would say, oh, that clan has witches or something. It's 
that is very good in witchcraft. Uh, that clan sold a child for uh, or whatever, I mean, very negative things. It bothered for a long time, but I did not know what to do about it. Until sometime in the, at the University of California, Irvine, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, I had, I realized this. Those 10 girls or women did not have any brothers. Okay? So it really, literally, there's one man and 11 women. So those girls had to do everything. They must have known and they must have known how to build, how to make things, right? They must have known how to make weapons to defend themselves. So they must have made weapons, okay? They must have known how to hunt, everything. And they must have known how to plan, use their mind. And I felt like a revelation, literally. And in fact, I thought this was, wait a minute, this is actually the original feminists, right? <laughs> so, one night, literally, I woke up and started writing the epic. And it says, yeah, I'll give you a brief outline. Uh, the nine daughters, or ten daughters, were born in the shadow of Mount Kenya. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. And seven, nine ostriches left, rode on the waves, on the wind, like horses with the trumpets. These are big as trumpets talking about their beauty. Okay. And wherever young men were, were there in the continent, each would see the beauty in their dreams, and each would wake up to pursue this dream of beauty in their minds, or in their, in the beauty in their dreams. They would follow the rivers, whatever was near the river, but then they found other young men had similar ideas, pursuing this beauty. They followed the major rivers of the continent uh, towards the mountain of the moon or the mountain of ostrich whiteness, what we call Mount Kenya. Some fell on the wayside, others this. So on an nine passed, came to the to uh, the home of Ikoyo and Mount. Now remember there are ten women. 99 men. Go tell them, mom, tell them now. Now you have to prove who you are, testing. Eh? You go back to the mountain and bring me each some handful or whatever in a gourd of that moon whiteness. That's all Mount Kenya. Bring it all. At the same time, I want something else. Let me explain. The ninth or brother, who normally is not hardly mentioned in the myth, is called Warigia. And she is born without far legs. Okay? So she is, um, how shall I say, grown woman, except for the legs. But there's a cure for her. And the cure lies in a hair that cures all, and the hair grows in the middle of the tongue of a, novel, a man eating ogre. Okay? Right? And something more, the ogre actually is invisible. <laughs> Except for the tongue, occasionally. That when it comes to capture, any of them. So, this is the task they are given. But the girls are not left behind. They go with them. They will go through whatever difficulties they come through. They will be part of the challenges they meet on the way. Okay. 
Of course, you're going to read the rest for yourself. <laughs> but let me tell you, again, they were uh, mothers of matriarchs of the nine clans of the good people. And have you heard of them, Domi? Some of them, yes. Some of them. Oh, can you tell us a little about one of them, maybe? <laughs> can you come here? Sure. Okay. Um, is there our boy here? Oh, one boy, right here. One boy? Yes. One boy. One boy. One boy. One boy. One boy. One boy. Okay. 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 The clan. Okay. The clan of our boy. What do they say about the clan of our boy? One boy. One boy. One boy. At the Mumboy era, era where the Yakahi Jahi Ninga Mormon. And what you do, Alan? Eh, Asha. One boy, Aga, to me, Kahi, to Ido, Ediana. That is all kind of kill to kill you, Jahi, Maho, Namakiran. Kahi, kill no more. Mukwakiongo taka iletu na tuahona. Kae ne makahe na kailetu gotire otangi hono kia boroliye. Oh maga kio do agita ga jata amenye mibire ya deode. Awa boine moara. Here. Ato ngoni diye boto engo muile wa wa boine leto. Yamishore. Wa boine yamishore. Yes. Zebra. Aha. Zoyo no huo. Hey. Yam misore eke henia we ruine. No matimuna hiyo. Ze magira. Hey. Wabuinake. Wabuine mo hiyo. Na reke kwe yo doge. Na kai neki yo ruai. Hey. Hey. Yo takwe ne rido hayo. Asha. I got a hard do. I like a movie, I keep going to be over. Moheka, Moheka, I get over the rock of battery. I'm a boy, to it. Oh, she never would. You don't want to be a good one. You don't want to be a good one. One guy. One Ah, right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. This one is dedicated to you. Wangari, Ninawa, Angari. Muheka, Muheka, Yajiri. I Wangari, Ninawa, Angari. Muheka, Wangari, 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 Wangari eo rumeta wangari na mayigo mange uveri ota guo. Eme toketa ya angari, akira angira otari, akira angoni aliyamari. Na le mwala, ate liye wea, aduma abe mahone doma. Mauro wakela makio rutana hinya, na keo na wedo. Aike hindiye garege singai. Yona adhaate leera hine eke ora na siyo boli ike honoka. Oika ka agarisi ya kono ora mesiri ya ne inoro lea muoyo. No agarisi ya kono ora aliyo ne inoro lea gekuo. Angarele kero lewa. Ate kwe muana ke watu ile ahumbinite kuoko Mwalimo, hali ya aga imidiyo ni wangari, ati yorugari yoshio. Doka wana nyo ne nyo wangari. I had said that they are 
father and mother were young, Iko and Mombi. And although we say that they were brought there by God, because Iko people never say they eat things by them. They always say, God helped me do this. God made me come to the mountain. So, uh, but in my narrative, they must have come from elsewhere. But came to the mountain, but they don't say, I brought myself to the mountain. They say, God, you know. And they were, oh my God, when they, uh, oh yes. Uh, When they came to the top of the mountain, they saw the beauty of the line in front of them, and they were totally, that's how they knew they had got to the right place. And that's why they said God brought them there, because the beauty of the land was absolutely mesmerizing, and they simply fell into a song, or they broke into a song. <laughs> The book is selling outside, I believe. Huh? It will eventually be translated into English and it says a perfect nine. And I'm, I understand there is a translation about to go into operation, into Kipsigis? Keep, keep and I, So we might actually see it translated to other languages before the English one or at about the same time. And Kiswahili, I hope. Thank you. Since I'm taller, somebody might have to adjust the mic. <laughs> I was trying to make fun of his height, but he gave me the joke. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, when I was sitting there, uh, Dr. Joyce never passed me a note to say that, uh, that Fafa cheated in the duel because he brought somebody on stage to help him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, as you're thinking, as you're thinking about who is winning, keep that in mind. Some of us are not playing fair. <laughs> I, on the other hand, have only my pen. Right? So, let, let me begin by thanking our SPU uh, and, of course, to Dr. John Dabula, you know, who really, you know, and, and of course, the powers that be here, you know, but it's Dr. Dabula who really made my visit possible and all the connections and networking and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, also to Dr. Joyce Nyairo uh, for agreeing to moderate. Um, if you, yeah, she wrote this, um, it was a review of my brother T's book. Uh, it's called The, the Goge's Jukebox Dance. I don't know if that, that stayed with me. <laughs> you know, because it turns out in all our writing, you know, the Goge's and all their writing, we all have a jukebox. I don't know why, you know, but uh, for, those, for, those, for those of you interested in writing and psychology, that would be a, a, a good start. Um, yeah, also, I wanted to say it also means a lot for me to be here in the moon. Uh, I grew up in Ghetto, about 15 minutes from here. Uh, I went to Tugani Primary School, uh, went to Delia Secondary School, then went to Kalunga. So, you know, yeah, in other words, I'm what if I call a local boy. Uh, but don't call me boy, maybe, <laughs> maybe just a local pro. <laughs> You know, yeah, and then also to be in the mood also, yeah, and to be on this stage with my father, to share the stage with my father, and of course with my brothers and friends here as well. But also equally importantly, uh, with my wife here, Maureen Park, Dr. Maureen Park. She's a real doctor, like, Papa who has honorary doctorates. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Ujeta mtoni, unamtoni, masiteta Ekaya ni ekaya Ndiza kupinda, ekaya ni ekaya Umamela kakulu, kuleiti sitango Sikona, masia ekaya Our home is home My dear, walk to me It is hot today, but tomorrow will be cool My dear, come to me, I want to ask you a question What will tomorrow bring? What do you say? What is it with you? Speak. Home is home. Repeat after me. Home is home. Listen well. We are here. And it is late now. Let us go home. I thank you. Um, so that challenge about those who fail to translate. Um, <laughs> professor is being attacked. Let me give him a chance to respond. I must respond to that one. <laughs> Uh, oh yes, I can see. He said, unlike Sam. But I did not get names. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> so my challenge is, you you wrote yours in? Uh, it's Kosa. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do one in Luo. Yeah. <laughs> and furthermore, I'm going to step further. I'm going to teach them law in two minutes. Two minutes, okay? In our law language, <laughs> when, we, <laughs> when you want to refer to me, I, is A, okay? R, A, correct? When you want to refer to, to you who is in front of me, it is E, like the one who plays with you, India. E, okay? You got me so far? Yes. When you refer to him or her, it's O, or O, O, like zero, okay? Is there a low speaker here? Is that so far? Right? So, if you know that, all you need to know it just a verb and fit it there. <laughs> <laughs> Say for instance, you the one with me, which is to go or going. So, you say, yeah, I be, E be, or be. Now play around with it. <laughs> Say, Avidala. Avidala. Oh, huh? huh? Or even Nairobi. Or huh? Avid Kisum. Huh? And then you can go on elaborating. Then you go to we, we are now going to all that. But I uh, want to teach you one. When I went to Kisum, I said I must. I mean, I'm going to talk. Blue language spoken here, I must also, you know. So what the book we are uh, celebrating is a book published by East African Education Publishers, and it's called Somo Bear. Okay? Somo Bear. So I thought, Somo Bear? I saw that performing in my mind. Somo Bear? Diko Bear. Yeah? And if you have the copper, some of the air, it's more bear. Okay? And if you have the small bear, Kenya, my bear. And if you have Kenya, my bear, Africa, so, so bear. So it goes like this so bear. If you say so bear, then I said you can say the copper. Kismo bear, Kenya bear, and then all of us, Africa bear. Okay? So remember, if I say somo, somo bear, the other side says, uh, Kismo bear, all of us, Africa, let's try it. We shall end up becoming more speakers in two. <laughs> okay? We just say, somo, Africa, therefore, so bear. Huh? Got it? Well, I'm not too bad.
please let us know if you um, yeah, so we're trying to share a mic here. Just okay, yeah, okay. No. 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 okay. So I was trying to free their hands so that they could fight properly, but that's okay. Um, oh yes, my hand is tight, that's why. <laughs> that's why he's losing the fight. Uh, no. There's um this my doctor, my son, they are biased against they are gang against me. <laughs> it's intergenerational now. No, we won't do that. Um you know, there's a really important point that they have just raised, uh, particularly Prof here, about language and culture and the need to not only battle for the right to your own culture, but to have a responsibility to learn about the culture of the other person, yeah? But we're not going to get into that right now. I want to start in a slightly different place. Um, because I think I had Prof say something about writing at night. So I want to ask, because you're amongst family, you're at home, your secrets are safe here. Is there something that most people don't know about the way you write? Like, is there a particular t-shirt that you have to wear to write? Do you write lying down? Like, what's that thing? What's that habit that you have cultivated over time that always works for you as a writer? Prof, shall we start with you? Media yeah. obviously is the same. Oh, that's good. As you can see, I'm so generous as giving you the microphone. I can keep that in mind. Um, in the, I would make a joke and say I'm like Bruce Lee, you know, not to make him scared of me, do um, but in, in terms of uh, being so good at everything that I don't have one specific way of doing it, okay, okay I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> no, the, the, the only thing I can think of is I tend to, to write in one space for maybe intensely for maybe a month and then I exhaust that space. So I have to keep moving, I have to keep moving to different spaces. Um, but I, but I'm, but I'm not the sort of discipline writer who will say, I'm going to write from 6 to 9 and 7 and so forth. <laughs> so I write in uh, intense parts so, uh, of energy. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, I don't have anything special by way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, in the sense I'm like that a little bit. I don't have a, a writing hours. I don't sort of say from 6 to 7. Uh, it depends on my mood. But the mood, if I get a very interesting idea, like when I wrote Kenda uh, Moyulu, I could write whenever I've got time. I mean, that was between my teaching, if I find a little bit of space, I can go and write. The other thing is, when I, when I, I'm, I get used to a play, if I, if at my home, I sit on a particular chair, when I begin to write, I, no matter what I do, I have to keep on sitting on that chair. Or if it's facing a particular side of the house, I find myself always you know, doing the same for the duration of that you know, uh, work. Uh, but in terms of time, I remember when I was writing um, uh, Wizard of the Crow, which took me about 10 years to write. But I was really obsessed with the novel. So much so that I even, I even began enjoying waiting at the airport because it gave me space. And one time I missed my plane <laughs> at the airport because I was so engrossed in it. I was in Chicago actually. I was so engrossed in it that I lost count of time and went to the wrong gate. Yeah. Um, so it really, it really depends on what I'm writing. Yeah. But I don't have the discipline of waking at 6 o'clock and doing it. But when I'm in the mood, I can even wake up in the middle of the night and just write it, you know. I can scribble, I can be in a lecture like this, and if the idea is, I can find myself writing while also listening to the lecture, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think on that score it's one or they write in basically the same way. <laughs> Eclectic, any space will do, any space can be exploited. Um, I'm not going to keep score as we go along, I'll ask you at the end to be the judge. Uh, Mukoma, I have a question for you specifically. When I go through the streets of Twitter, um, Kenyans on Twitter, I see an incredible amount of talent as far as wit is concerned, clever wordplay, um, there's a fair amount of unworthy invective as well, but there's, there's certainly some creativity there. 
uh, that I see from Kenyans on Twitter. And I wonder, do you, I don't know that you've paid as much attention to it, but do you think, given that wealth of talent, we are seeing as many Kenyan writers emerge as that talent suggests? <laughs> um, yeah, so, first I think it depends, I would have to go back to the question of language. Right? Uh, in fact, I wanted to highlight this uh, as we were talking about in, in the earlier section where this is by Professor Paula who introduced you to this other NIR here. Uh, and the book is called God Speaks in Our Own Languages, right? And I've been going around and saying, you know, this is the most succinct uh, understanding of, of, of why we should, you know, be writing anything in our own languages. Because I, I keep making the joke, I mean, would you be cheating somewhere and then God comes and speaks to you in Latin, right, or French or whatever, right? You know, so, so, so I, I think the question of one language. Now, when we did the last Mabadi Israeli Prize for African Writing, we had 116 manuscripts, right? Uh, there was a time we had a, a, a policeman who won, a Kenyan policeman who won, who had been working on his novel for 20 years. So I actually beat him for the ten, first 10 years of Wizard of the Cross. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and sometimes I ask myself, okay, so, okay, who's a real writer? Is it that guy who's sitting there writing that novel in Israeli for 20 years with no hope of publication? Or is it me who was a literary agent, you know, I already have this connection. So, so there's that question of language, of what language are we talking about? Um, but I, I, I think people are writing. I, I, you know, I've judged several, uh, you know, poetry, poetry and, um, and then short, short fiction, you know, uh, contests. I, I, I think people are writing. We just need to increase more avenues for them to create. We need, like you say, we need more of everything, right? We need more journals, literary prizes uh, in all languages. Yeah, so, so yeah. But, but it's, and also I just wanted to add that I, that, and I'm not saying this is what you're asking, right, you know, but um, the idea that we don't have a reading culture, I, I think that's a myth. That we, because, yeah, because of Twitter, if you're Twitter, you know, you're reading Facebook, you know, you write some of it is terrible, but you're still writing and, and, and you know, and reading, yeah. Uh, so what do you think, um, Prof, what is it that makes writing, you know, some clearly very talented people who never actually emerge as writers, and I think Obama has hinted slightly about institutions, why? But why is writing also something that some people, no matter how they try and escape it, they will end up there regardless of what they were doing? What is it about this particular, shall I call it a vocation or shall I call it a job? How, how do you like to I'm going back to it, however. Yeah. It's, it's like, I'm, I'm, sometimes it's like an obsession. I can't help it. And I know this, uh, first of all, let me say this. Uh, imagination is the greatest democratic equalizer. You know, uh, imagination does not know PhDs or private schooling, woman, man, child. You know, uh, we can create with our own imagination. And Again, imagine it's not respect of the fact that you read so many novels. Someone can write their first novel and becomes more readable, more interesting than the one who has been writing novels all his life, you know. Or like me, who wrote a little between in English, and even today people when I meet you they say that oh hello, great writer, whatever I read you a little between. And I keep on saying can they at least mention that? <laughs> yeah. In, in other words, in, in, in the Chinua Chebe, things fall apart. His first novel, in a way, is still the most outstanding novel but in his work, rather than what he wrote later. You know, so imagination, you, who are you know, each one of you has a book, okay? And you can write, that's gone. But it's also hard work. This is where the difference comes in, you know. I can work, even when, remember my first four novels, five novels, I wrote longhand. We didn't have, but you have to keep on, keep at it. Somebody read the whole man is all over again from beginning to end, or whatever. So there must be that drive has to be there. When I went to, uh, when I was put in prison, aha, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> Some of you know to know that, okay? I tell you, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I went to do my job in California, <laughs> right? 
You know, I was once put in a committed maximum security prison, eh? all because of the play Guy Tadera. Uh, or anyone knows this because, as I said, do you want many Patrick Shaw, the killer. Some of you may not, you may not, you may not know him, but he was a, a killer fellow here called Patrick Shaw. The Colombia, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, God of the name of their witness that they had gone, they were waiting for Guru Amiri in his house, outside his house, and it happened that in a matato he was driving from Nairobi to his home in Galaria. There, he was told that Patrick Shaw is waiting for him. Okay, so he got back to the same matato, went back to Nairobi, and he went underground, reappearing in uh, Zimbabwe. So, anyway, uh, in my case, it was after I was married when I want that I was put in. Gohamir was put in or being hunted after uh, mother sing for me, or my daughter Yugira, you know. I, uh, after that died there, and I was put in a maximum security prison, committed a maximum security prison. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, what saved me, really, surviving a professor yesterday, <laughs> chairman, of, chairman of a department, a well-known writer all over the world, you know, being in a prison cell, no books, no paper, no pen. <laughs> it was really, I don't know, it's, it's, you're used to books for your life, and then you don't have it. I fell, it fell to my imagination in a way. It really helped me. Two things happened to my imagination. At the same time, I realized I was breaking jail every single night. Right? It's amazing because I could visit home. Uh, I visited you at home, come on. <laughs> <laughs> to check whether your music, you know, the other house, check on your music and others, you know, and I would recall from my we had had, then I would come back to prison, okay. Uh, I did so many things, you know, uh, and I think that imagination was making me break through the free prison walls. And I just such power that they cannot jail my imagination. It's something, almost a sensation that I felt they cannot, the one thing they cannot do is uh, uh, imprison my imagination. The only thing they can do now is kill me. Otherwise, without killing me, and I want imagination, I can break jail every time, okay? And that's when I started writing. And then, in the same prison, I started thinking about African languages and English and so on. And that's what actually when I made a decision to now start writing novels in the language. Okay, yeah. before we go to language, um, you know, you've raised a really important point there about the risks of writing, the risks of knowledge. Um, and also you pointed out uh, one big difference or oh, is it an advantage Mukama has? Yeah, technology. So he wrote longhand. You've never had to write longhand. So can we give the price? Of no, hold it, hold not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on when I started writing. Because when I started writing, we didn't have computers. Then, you know, uh, I didn't see a computer until uh, 1990, and those were the old ones. But, but fine, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah you, you, you granted that. Well, be gradually, yes. gradually. Okay. <laughs> so I know that you mentioned it briefly when you were on the podium and, and you kind of tried to slide past it. But I'm still going to ask this question because it's disturbed me for the longest time. Mm -hmm. There is this one scene that runs through the writing of all the goodies, whether we're talking about Wajiko, we're talking about uh, Tivia, mm -hmm. we talk about Dad, and we talk about you. So the scene, it's a bar, a pub. <laughs> There's one of the characters who is music playing in the background. One of the characters stands up, walks to the jukebox, puts in a coin, selects a song, and starts to dance. Uh, I miss it already. <laughs> You're missing that scene. Either dancing by the jukebox, 
usually dancing alone, but selecting a song and dancing. So, so this jukebox, is it that you people as a family own jukeboxes? Do you manufacture them? Why does this joke keep coming up even when you're writing? Oh. You can't avoid it now, you have to answer it. Yeah, that's, that's for Governor and... Yeah. <laughs> I story. will remind you of the yeah. minutes of glory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. There are gift boxes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a gift box. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah, true. No, I mean, it, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, one of the things yeah. I loved was actually going to a bar, I mean, of course, you know. I don't reveal the age I started going, uh, because my daughter is here. But anyway, <laughs> it, but, 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 no, but one of the things I loved was going to the that, that whole process. So, you know, you, you know, you have some coins. First, you have to go get change, you know, from from from, from the bar, and then, you know, then you select, then you spend some time going through the, you know, that those are the days when you have to flip the brain, and then you find the song, and you're trying to read the mood of the bar. Then you select the perfect song, and then sometimes you go to get up and dance. But um, so 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 that that aspect of it, but the whole idea of music as well. But that physicality of it, I love that. But um, there was a, there was a friend of mine who is now who has now passed away. Uh, from, he was a South African controversy as well, uh, freedom fighter, um, and he was in exile in, uh, I believe, in Angola. So he was telling me this story one day about how he went to a bar, right, and, you know, he played some music and uh, the bartender who was a woman, you know, came and they danced and they said they danced for hours, they didn't talk. Um, you know, and then, and then they just parted ways. Yeah. You know, yeah, and I think in a lot of ways, any, any time I'm thinking about music, uh, any time I'm writing about the jukebox or music in general, I'm trying to understand that conversation that we're having. Yeah, yeah music, I think, I, I think that, <clears throat> I know what, I know music runs in my family, but not from my side of the family. I do not mean from me, you know. But yes, ma we just had him sing, but he's yeah, not but, yeah, but their mother, Nyabura, was actually a very good singer. Came from a family of singers. So there's a kind of uh, something that runs through the music. The uh, uh, here is actually a pretty good composer. A shy one, I admit, but you know, a composer, you know, all the same. When they were children, one of the things I have never, I've not forgotten is a still they compose as children about a person who is bringing water. We didn't have water then in our house, we get the water. So we asked somebody with a donkey to bring the water, we, you know, and we kind of bought water. And they compose a song. What if in a What if in a Okay. Something. Correct, Leo? Just about to say, what a terrible song. No, but the thing is that children, it's a very, I think it's still in my mind. Let me put this way. For me, it's still in my mind. I'm not, a, I'm not a composer, but I stay in my mind. Okay. Uh, do you think I can, what you can bear witness to this? Um, some of the best melodies in Gaika Deda, where melodies actually composed by Nyoho. I gave him the words, he put a completely new melodies, and they were very, very beautiful. Uh, Kimunya also gave him words, and he got another melody. There were some of the most outstanding melodies in Gaika Deda. So what I'm saying, is kind of a running theme in my, my, my family. Me, I can hear music in my head, but it's a problem <laughs> when it tries to come out of my mouth, I don't want to open it. You know, uh, and, uh, now I have started at 70 years of age, I enrolled in the piano classes, you know, so we play the piano a little bit, you know, but even then, no tune. <laughs> I can only play. I can only play that which is on paper. I can read music and play, but I cannot sort of create even the simplest tune that they are able to do. So there is that element. But having said that, we just say it's about music and rhythm. Actually, music and rhythm is in all our lives. You just watch people actually walking. In some ways, I. I you know, the California, I sometimes stand sitting and just want to be walking. Because I realize people are walking rhythmically. 
they are working musically, <laughs> right? Yes, you see they are eating some uh, one beat, another uh, to make the same, they, they, they make two of them, so you get a full note, uh, half notes, quarter notes, and so on, you know, when they are walking, and then you get their combination, and it's really very, very interesting. You try to watch people here outside, you see they are walking musically. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was going to say, um, yeah, so I have a novel that's coming out uh, with Casava Republic Press called uh, We Sing the Tizita to a Very Hard Dead. And it's all about, uh, okay, if, if you don't know Tizita music, uh, just go to YouTube and Google Tizita. It's a form of Ethiopian, Ethiopian music. Um, and it's more like blues, right? But it's more about, it's, it's almost as if the musicians are fighting about this soul of, of Ethiopia, right? It's, you know, and nobody can tell you exactly what it means, but when you listen to it, you can feel it. Yeah, so, so, so in that novel, um, I have four musicians who are competing to see who's the best visitor, visitor musician. Yeah. So the remarkable thing here that you're both saying, um, if I understand you correctly, uh, you know, when you're a creative person, the intertextuality, it's writing, it's music, it's yeah. sound, yeah. you're also an observer yeah. of life. Yeah. Um, like the people watching we've just described and the kind of thoughts that, that run through. Yeah. And so we will be talking about language, but the other important thing you said here is that music is also a language. Yeah, if I understood you correctly. Um, let me ask, um, we've, you know, we've talked a little about writing practices of writing habits of writing. Let's also talk about mentoring, because when you get to a certain stage in life, uh, particularly when success uh, is around you, mentoring becomes part of what you do. So if you could just talk a little about that. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Mokoma. You know, in the lottery of life, life in some ways is a lottery, okay? Yeah. So you found yourself the son of an incredibly successful creative writer. And you grew up with a uh, immense, <laughs> <laughs> incredible, <laughs> um, you know, not just the son of an incredibly cre uh, successful creative writer, but also you grew up with the privilege of books around you. It is a privilege. Sometimes when we talk about privilege, we think about money in the pocket, but let's talk about the other privileges that we have. So you grew up with books all around you. That's something that your father gave to you. You did not earn it. You did not apply for it. It's a lot of your life. What's the one thing that you would say your father has gained from the fact of you being a writer? That because you became a writer, there's something magical that happened in his writing, in his creativity. Is there? Or did you just say, did you give? <laughs> oh, well, but he's not going to answer that. <laughs> oh, I want to hear it from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean. She's your sister, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. the first part of your question, right? Yeah, no, I completely agree, and the reason why I come to think about the absence of structures, right? The absence of structures is that I understand my, my own upbringing and how lucky I was there to be surrounded by books. You know, I keep saying, when I sat down and said I wanted to write a, a, a book, I had no doubt, like, there was a time I attempted a memoir at 14, you know? Yeah, so, of course, of course it was very short. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but even then, you know, like, I never had any doubt I could sit down and write a book because I was seeing it being done, right? I grew up reading Richard Wright, I mean, even from a very young age, because I read whatever I could in the house. Yeah, so, so that's why I ended up thinking about, okay, so for me, I had, I could see the, I wrote this stairway to the book, so to speak, right? But for most people, uh, and some of the questions I get of your mentor, some of the questions I get, uh, they tell me that that person doesn't have a, a ladder between their dream and the actual book, right? You know, so, so, so in that sense, I understand the privilege. Um, but for us to, it has to, but for us to create those that ladder, it has to be a collective, it has to be a collective effort, right? You know, because I'm talking about, uh, you know, I mean, in, um, for example, my daughter's school right now, right? You know, she's she's eight years old, but she's taking a nap as I talk. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably, but I think in her school they do some form of creative writing, right? Around them, you know, they have little magazines and so on and so forth. The, the little town we have probably has more magazines than you know, literary magazines that, that, that in Kenya, for example, right? So, so we have to create those structures. Um, anyway, to answer your question, I, I, I would like to believe I've made my father a better writer. 
<laughs> yeah, but, but, but I can't I can't think of a single um, you know a single instance. Yeah, but you know, but we exchange manuscripts. You know, yeah. you know, like we talk about writing all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, we do discuss a lot. You know, our writings generally, uh, and uh, I personally get personally get, as a writer, I get inspired by the fact that I fall published. Right, yeah, you can somebody check to see if we can win the Guinness Book of Records, because now there's some of us in the family. Somebody really yeah. needs to look into that, yeah. I'm not going to tell you about that better family, because I'm going to break your heart. The last two, <laughs> the last two, invite to Harvard, to Amherst, Cornell, I think, you know, and other places to talk about this phenomenon. Because it's like people are talking about it as a phenomenon, you know. Uh, you know what, in Vienna, I believe, you know, is Vienna or Venice? Is Vienna? Yeah. They had an exhibition about the Transit project for a whole year and so on, you know. Uh, he is very Kenyan, <laughs> Moses Gilolo. And I get, I, I get inspired by him, Richard Awar, and others you work with, you know, right? Yeah, it's very inspiring to. To, to be in contact with that. Oh, yeah. but can I add something because we're talking about the young people here as well? Sure. Yeah, so uh, just to add to, to what Papa said, so what Moses Lola and his team did was to make it right history, right? You know, so now Papa's short story is the most translated short story uh, in, in African literary history. So if you're a PhD student or you're thinking about doing a master's a thesis in like, writing and so on and so forth, you know, will you do the same old type thing of, uh, I don't know, who's worth, I don't know. You know, or will you look at how translating between African languages uh, and create theories that are dealing with how translating between African languages might be different, uh, very different from translating between French and, um, let's say, French and English. In other words, uh, the future of originality, as I understand it, and now I'm not full of my scholarly heart. The future of, uh, yeah, of scholarly innovation and, uh, you know, and originality and so on and so forth lies in the untapped resources in, Africa, in our African languages. It's, it's interesting that um, you've gone in that direction. I'm totally running out of time, but what I am going to do... We always have time. <laughs> <laughs> what I am going to do um, with uh, the permission of our organizers, I'm going to ask three more questions, okay, from here, and then I will take two questions from the floor. And we are not going to do that Kenya that says, mine is not a question, it is a comment. No, ask a question that starts with, where, when, why, how, what? Okay? And then we'll like, but let's come back here. We were just getting scholarly, which is exciting. I was thinking, so 50 years ago, Prof, you led this great movement with others like uh, the late great Henry Warren Moore at the University of Nairobi. 1969, you led this great movement to decolonize the curriculum. Yeah. And we saw more brown and black names come to the curriculum, a kind of black aesthetics. <coughs> Um, and then the whole development of what we call oracha, or oral literature, the kind of performance that you saw here from the drama group, and saying that that too is literature. It doesn't have to be written, it doesn't have to be in a language that um, belongs to the canon, it can be uh, an African language, and that was a remarkable revolution. I want to ask, Mpoma, what's the balance of the work with that? Do you think that you as a scholar have pushed the frontiers of what your father and others in his generation did to turn um, the practice of literature to the next level. What's the balance of the work in that decolonizing of the curriculum? Yeah, so, so we were decolonizing the mind, you know, and, and the whole, you know, the decolonial movement, if you want to call it that, has done is to make me try to understand why, you know, it's as if it's pushing me backwards, actually, right? to look back into our literary history. And in my book that just came out, my scholarly book that just came out last year called The Rise of the African Novel, in that novel I'm asking why we begin our literary clock, our African literary clock with, uh, with Chinua Chepe, or in most where we're most generous, right? And then we move on to Adichie and so on and so forth. Why we don't talk about, for example, early South African writers who are writing in African languages from the 1880s to, let's say, the 1940s. You know, and they're writing in African languages and then getting translated into English. And they aren't just one off, right? Well, literary critics, when we talk about them now, we talk about them as if, oh, it's just one guy out there was written. Right, or a movement, the same people who started the ANC, the same guys who gave us the Mkosi Africa, right? 
a person like Saul Plaja had gone all the way to the US, met with, uh, with uh, WB Du Bois. In other words, you know, there are a movement, right? So the question for me becomes, why do we begin our African literary block at the wrong historical period? And then you can go back further and ask, okay, Amharic literature itself begins in the 1200s, right? Why don't we talk about Amharic literature, Afro-Arab literature, 500 AD? Why don't we talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, slave narratives, Afri Afri Black American slave narratives as part of African literature? So, so yes, part of decolonizing is not just about moving forward. I think it's going back and recovering uh, this history because first, the literary history is there, you know. The, uh, so, uh, at some point, as a scholar, I just fail to understand how this happened. Right, yeah, but, but I do have an answer in the rest of the African novel. Um, okay, I, and that's a fair point, that there's a lot of going back to do. But what about going forward? I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you talked about uh, your children, four of your children as published writers, and I'm asking myself, why have they all been so conservative in their treatment of the novel as a Western form? Um, I heard in one of your interviews, one of your joint interviews, how your father introduced you to this fictional character as a family, he'd always tell you stories about Mwangi Cowboy. And Mwangi Cowboy is something that you all share, and everybody has added to that story. You have uh, several detective novels, yeah? Uh, Nairobi Heat, there's Black Star, there's Mrs. Shaw, uh, Dosho has a, a detective novel as well, Wanjiko's The Fall of Saints is also a detective novel. Why hasn't Mwangi Cowboy become something that you guys all write, so that we have a published novel that is by four or five people. Why are we sticking to the Western tradition that says the novel can only be the creation of one individual who gets credit, and yet we've just talked about how communally you work. So I'm thinking, with form, have you been a little conservative? Is there a little boundary that you can push? Um, so, I mean, okay, okay, it's a fair point. When it comes to Monkey Cowboy, right, we haven't, we haven't mined Monkey Cowboy well enough. But, but I would say, I, I mean, as, as far as I understand myself, you know, that I'm one of the people who are pushing the boundaries, actually, right? First, uh, even when we think about aesthetics, right, the detective, the, 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 the detective novel of popular fiction hasn't had much respect, right? Now, you know, it's happening, you know, and it's happening because it's not just me there, you know, the, the, I think there's a movement amongst, uh, amongst my generation and the younger generation of saying, no, the, the novel cannot just be one thing. Um, you know, and I will go further and argue that, that with the Yambo, for example, Diago in, a, in, a, in Nairobi, he is actually Mwangi Cowboy, right? In, in, in other words, it, 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 to me, actually, you know, he is Mwangi Cowboy in that regard. Um, but definitely, definitely, there, there is room for innovation, and I think, you know, young African writers are doing that, you know, better than, you know, better than my generation. It's a wonderful challenge you put there about translating between uh, African languages and just pushing those frontiers um, all the time. I'm going to ask, um, Okay, let me do this because we could talk until tomorrow. I'm going to ask you, Prof, one last question. Well, so, he gives the last word. Uh, do you want me to give the last word? I will. No, 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 to do the same question, I promise. <laughs> so, um, your career has been so successful in terms of just your sheer pr uh, productivity, how prolific you've been, but also, you know, dissertations have been written, um, awards have been given, many, many awards, honorary doctorates, one only from a Kenyan university, what is wrong with us? Um, but you have received a lot of recognition. Um, and then, so it's 2016, and you get nominated for the Nobel Prize in literature. I knew, and I knew it was going to come. You knew it was going to go there. Let's go there because we're at home and you're on fire. So you get nominated, articles are written, you know, in the mainstream media, in social media. This expectation, beds are placed, breaths are held, there's a drum roll, we are waiting, we are waiting, and then the Nobel Prize in 2016 goes to Bob Dylan, yeah. a white American pop singer who is recognized for his contribution to transforming the American folk music. How did you feel? That morning when you woke up on Thursday, October 13, 2016, and you got the news of Bob Dylan's award. How did you feel? You're a monk's okay. you're a monk's friend. I can, I can tell you a few stories. I'm going to tell you. I'm a storyteller, basically, so <laughs> let me tell you a story. Not, not about that particular one. I think there was one time when the South American guy won, and they had put in the press that I would win, okay? And even my university was so excited <laughs> that they sent, oh, there's a picture, is it here? No. 
I don't see any my Nobel Prize teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one was a Nobel Prize teacher. <laughs> so the University of California, I mean, have, but the University of California have I, because we have many others, you know. They sent photographers to prepare. The first they set up a press conference <laughs> at 11 o'clock the following day. And they sent photographers to have pictures ready for which they will spread the whole world, okay? And now, <laughs> and my wife, Jerry, can tell you this. At 4 o'clock, you know, they announced it at mid summer. At the time when they announced it in, 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 uh, in Sweden, it is actually 4 o'clock in the morning in California. What happened was, we found that there was paparazzi outside our house. They were then count outside my house. Okay? It's Mombi who actually had it. Someone had, had won. So it was very interesting. It was, we opened the door for the uh, journalists and they came in and it was so sad. <laughs> now, what was it? It's my wife who's consoling them. <laughs> Question goes to Professor Mungu. 
you talk about how African languages inspire you, and we know that you've been a champion of African languages and writing in African languages. But my question is, what is the rationale for you and other writers to write in an African language then have the work translated into English, for example, not other African languages? Because you know most of your work has been translated also into English. You write in who you and then you have it translated in English. What is the rationale? Thank you. Uh, so the second one, right at the back, at the top, is green. Please start by telling us your name. And if I know my I favored only the girls, that's because I did. <laughs> <laughs> we are still um, in the battle to give African women voices. <laughs> because you are told to start the questions in the way, I was when I was uh, nine years old, I read, uh, <laughs> I read, 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 and I recommended it to anyone who either works in the church. I'm a St. Paul's alumni of uh, divinity. Um, and so my, my question is to both uh, Professor and Mokoma. Because we, have, we, we are exposed to his fiction work, I mean his fiction work in the schools, how do we create a space for books like Secure the Base, which would be really le relevant for courses like international development or African studies, Asante? Uh, thank you for being so brief. No, we will not do this. Um, how do we, where do we start? Age before beauty or? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> we should start with beauty. Let's start with beauty. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I, I, you know, my first I wanted to take just a little tangent, you know, because I was, I was in, a, you know, in a place of theology, so I just wanted to throw this out there as something we should think about. Uh, because something that really, really bothered me, uh, I was in Ghana, uh, just two or three weeks ago, and I went and visited the slave castles there, right? You know, and the most striking thing for me there was that you'd have a dungeon where the slaves were kept, you know, before they were shipped off to the point of you know the point of no return and so on and so forth. But you'd have a dungeon there, and then on top of that, you'd have a church, literally. Like there is no, you know, the church is twice removed and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to leave that image out there for us, you know, to think about that, that sort of relationship between. Uh, and, and of course, I understand the concept of liberation theology and so on and so forth, but I just, I, I just wanted to share that with you so it's not with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, but I don't know, we, I think we need, we, we need to take ourselves seriously, right? We're talking about, you know, like creating spaces for, for literary theory. We need to take ourselves seriously and start introducing literary theory and start asking questions, and I, like, I was, like I was asking of why we begin the literary novel in, in the 1950s and, and so on and so on and so forth. So for me, I would say, yeah, I think we need to take all our total cultural output uh, very seriously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned secure the base, and uh, many people may not know what you are referring to, but you actually have a book called Secure the Base, Making Africa Visible in the World. Uh, the book has not been published in Kenya yet. Uh, so, uh, but I am sure it will be published in Kenya. But the question of secure the base is very important, even in the way I look at languages. Having your base in an African language does not in any way mean that you are antagonistic to any other language. That's very, very important. It's a question of relationship between language that matters, right? I love English, after all, I love English language. After all, professor, I'm not only professor, I'm a distinguished professor <laughs> of English and comparative literature. It's a beautiful language, it has great writers and so on. I love French, I love Russian literature, and so on. You know, is the relationship between our languages 
that I fight against. You know, my philosophy is sound by, by this sentence. That if you know in all the languages in the world, and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that's enslavement. On the other hand, if you know your mother tongue and add all the languages of the world to it, that's empowerment, right? So for instance, can you say, mother tongue as a foundation to secure the base, okay? Kiswahili, add to it. English, and a number of other languages, Okay, what I've been fighting against also is when a hierarchy is doing a lot of harm in relation between languages all over the world, not just in Africa, where we can never see language in terms of network, where they relate on the basis of equal give and take, but they relate in terms of hierarchy. Okay, I don't like English hierarchy. Of being at the top, but then I go ahead and say the coach should be at the top. You will really produce the hierarchies all the time. I do have to think differently, I think, in terms of languages as network, where they meet on the on the basis of equal give and take. And this is where translation comes comes in. Translation can help in this uh, give and take uh, relationship between, you know, uh, languages. So, please, uh, I don't hate English language. It's a beautiful language. Uh, I like it, and some of my books are in English, as well as the ones we are translated to English. But I'm equally happy that some of my books are translated in Vietnamese, and are translated in French, are translated in Japanese, and, and, and Spanish and so on, okay, yeah. It's the relationship that I find hierarchy is what I fight against. And that's why some two years ago, I think, Los Angeles Review of Books called Dub Me the Language Warrior. And now the term the language has stuck <laughs> with me because when I was in Calcutta recently, they will ask me, please, Kogin, Frosa Kogin, what does it mean to become a language, a language warrior? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, you know, as your daughter, I feel a little sad that you ended on the note of calling me a slave, but I won't take it personally. I think how we want to understand this is there's room for all our languages. And all our languages are capable of being used creatively. We can use all of those languages creatively. I hope that there will be a day in this country when the policy towards language says not so much mother tongue. I personally have a problem with the notion of a mother tongue. I prefer to talk of a first language. But I long for the day when it will be possible for each child joining standard one to have the option of learning two or three Kenyan languages by the time they graduate primary school, and possibly formally learning a second or fourth African or Kenyan language by the time they graduate secondary school. I know that we have the resources to create a curriculum for second language speakers. You know, how wonderful it was to hear you teaching us the Luo, because it's possible to be a second and third and fourth language speaker. I know that we have the resources to create that curriculum. I know that we have the resources to, ha uh, to find the teachers to teach those languages so that we also, as we move um, towards, um, or rather, as we develop devolved government, which very often is an ethnic corporation, but we make it an inclusive process. And it's really inclusivity that I think we are after. Uh, I think this is what we must promote so that before one another, the culture of the other is, is worthy. And I think that's a wonderful gift that you both give us, is the recognition that there is room for all of these languages. Uh, none is greater than the other. Shall we finish on that note? And I ask you to shake hands because you managed not to fight. Oh. That was beautiful. Yeah. Well, but he promised the fight is coming afterwards. <laughs> this is what he said. We shall not Thank you. Don't forget your copy of
Kaitamu yun, our side. Tanya and Nairobi.